beloved congregation, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. In many ways, when we approach scriptures, especially the, the Gospels, we're at a, a, a distance from the words that Jesus was saying. Chronologically, we're at a distance. Geographically, we're at a distance. And so often the images that he uses are unfamiliar to us too. They require us to step into the first century world of Galilee. But the image that Jesus uses in our text this afternoon, this evening, isn't like that. The yoke is something very familiar to us, or at least I expect it's familiar to most of you. It was a common agricultural implement in the ancient world, but it's something that we still see today. Maybe you've even used a yoke, something like a pioneer village. Maybe you have one decoratively hanging on the wall or so. But you can imagine in any case what a yoke is for, used especially by farmers, for the oxen, but also for carrying water buckets around. You can imagine how tired your shoulders and your back would get after carrying water buckets around for quite some time. In fact, the yoke is such a common image that we use it as a metaphor today. We'll talk about throwing off a yoke, throwing off a yoke in the sense of getting rid of a burden. But in Jesus' day, he's speaking to the crowds there at the Sea of Galilee, and he's talking about a very particular yoke. The people there were under the yoke of Rome, facing the oppression of the Roman Empire, taxation, military measures. But that's not the yoke he was referring to. He was referring especially to the yoke of slavery to the law. Jesus is talking to people who are burdened by a yoke of slavery to the law. And what he extends to the people sitting there in front of him, the people he was speaking to, he extends to us today. It's a tender invitation to lay down this yoke of oppression this heavy yoke that is upon us, and to take up his yoke, which is light and easy. So the theme of my sermon this evening is that Jesus invites weary sinners to find rest in him. We'll look at the sinner's burden, the Savior's yoke, and the soul's rest. So Jesus invites weary sinners, including us, to find rest in him. But first we need to consider what is this burden that the sinner bears? Jesus extends his invitation, we read it together, to all those who are heavy laden and who labor. What did he mean by that? Well, he was speaking to these crowds at the Sea of Galilee. They had just been listening to him denounce John the Baptist, or those who had rejected John the Baptist. There were those who said, John the Baptist is some kind of hermit. He rejects society. He does these weird things like eat locusts and, and honey. He wears these strange clothes and he must be crazy. And then they saw Jesus performing all sorts of miracles. And rather than focus on these miracles, raising the dead, giving, making the lame walk, giving sight to the blind, rather than focus on all these things, they, they saw that he sat down at table with prostitutes and tax collectors. And they said, he must be a drunkard and a glutton. And so obviously their reactions to both John the Baptist and to Jesus were missing the picture entirely. They you can get a glimpse of their, of their self-righteousness here. John the Baptist wasn't doing it right. Jesus wasn't doing it right. But they themselves, they had it all together. They were the ones who were on the right path. It was especially the Pharisees and the teachers of the, teachers of the law who were guilty of this. And guilty not only of doing this for themselves, but of laying this burden, this yoke, on the people who were supposed to be led by them, the people under their leadership. Listen to what Jesus, how Jesus condemns them later on in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So these Pharisees were placing on the people a heavy yoke, They obeyed the laws of Moses meticulously alongside a host of all sorts of other laws that they had been handed down through the generations. Laws that governed every aspect of life from washing your hands before meals to tithing the smallest herb in your garden. Life was simply about following an endless system of rules and regulations. And they were very successful, you could say, humanly speaking, in keeping these rules and regulations, these Pharisees. They had it all together. They could do it themselves. 
But Jesus accuses them of ignoring the heart, of ignoring matters of the heart. He says they're full of greed and wickedness on the inside. They overwhelmed the people too with laws that were either too many and too difficult to keep, which made them feel perpetually guilty, or that turned life just into this tedious, this endless living under the law. And so they were weary and burdened because they couldn't keep the law because they were sinners. They were sinners and the law could only be kept by those who could keep it perfectly, by those who were free from sin. And so they were burdened and weary. It's not that, it's a long time ago since Jesus spoke these words to his people there in, at the Sea of Galilee. But it's a problem that's plagued the church since then. Just think of the celebrations of Reformation Day we had this past week or the week before. There too, the church had come up with this vast system of laws that made life a burden because the people couldn't keep the laws and so they felt guilty and that life was just about guilt and burdens. But it's, it's no different today often. Can you relate to this? Do you feel at times burdened by the weight of rules that you can't follow, of laws that you can't keep? I think often, as Christians, we make it appear to those around us outside that Christianity is simply about following rules and regulations. It's just a prescribed list of do's and don'ts that need to be checked off and circled. And then when we struggle to keep these rules, we're tempted to despair. We question perhaps even our status as Christians or our relationship with God because we can't keep these laws. We make God's grace even dependent on our own performance. But when we focus on ourselves, when we focus on our own keeping of the law, our own ability to keep these regulations and rules, there's only two options. We either remain lost and guilt-ridden, or we stay self-righteous and far from grace. Because no amount of law-keeping can bridge the gap, the chasm between God's holiness and our sinfulness. It's only Jesus Christ who can accomplish this. He's the only one who can bring us together, sinful man and holy God. And so it's to weary and burdened sinners like ourselves that Jesus speaks now, this evening. Just like he spoke to the crowds at the Sea of Galilee. He says, come to me. Come to me, take my yoke upon, upon you, and learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble of heart. You hear the tender compassion in your Savior's voice. After sharply criticizing those people who had rejected John the Baptist, who had rejected Jesus himself, Christ turns to these crowds around him and he speaks tenderly to them. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Because the leaders who were supposed to be shepherding them were burdening them with these laws. Unlike the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Jesus is, is gentle and humble of heart. His call to the sheep is full of of love. He didn't come to call the righteous, in fact. He didn't come to call those who thought they were righteous and had it all together. He came for the sick. And so the Pharisees thought they were healthy and they weren't in need of healing. But it was the sick who found it in Jesus Christ. And so it was the tax collectors and the prostitutes who were entering the kingdom of God ahead of the most important people of the day, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. God's love was revealed to the little children and hidden from the ones who were wise and learned. And so it's to weak and weary sinners, not to the self-righteous, that Christ says, come, take up my yoke. But before we take up his yoke, we need to lay our burdens down. And so Christ's call is also a call for us to lay down our burdens at his feet. He says, cast off that old yoke that's weighing you down. Throw aside that old burden of the law and come to me. Come to me with empty hands. Come to me with, with bared shoulders. 
And he accomplishes, accomplishes this especially and above all at the cross. It's at the cross that Christ made it possible for us to lay down our burdens. On the cross, Christ hung there and the weight of God's wrath against our sin, the weight of God's wrath against our inability to keep the law was poured out on him. He kept the perfect law and so he could bear the weight of God's wrath. So it's at the cross that we put our burdens down. It's at the cross that we lay the sin and the guilt at the feet of Jesus Christ. It's at the cross that our crooked backs are straightened and our weak knees are strengthened. But the amazing thing is it doesn't just stop there. We don't just stop there at the cross and lay down our burdens, but we're free then to live a new life. We're free to take up Christ's yoke. Just like Christ didn't hang there and that was it. He descended into the grave, but he rose again to new life. The same goes for us. We don't just stop at the cross. We find new life in Jesus Christ. Now how? What's the secret to this? Well, the answer is our text. Jesus invites us to take up his yoke. Having shed our burdens, we bend our necks, we submit our necks to Jesus' yoke. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, we've just exchanged one oppressive yoke for another. And when Jesus presents the law, he certainly doesn't make it seem any easier, does he? In fact, when he focuses on the heart, it actually makes it much more difficult. It's much easier to keep external rules and regulations than to think about changing your heart. But then we miss the significance of who it is who's extending this invitation. It's not the self-righteous Pharisees who are calling us to change our hearts. It's the good shepherd. He's the one who, who gives us the resources, the means also to change our hearts. It's the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep who extends this invitation to us. He's the one who's offering it. And that's why this yoke isn't oppressive like the others. We can understand it a little better if we look more carefully at the description he's, he provides. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. His yoke is easy. That doesn't mean that it's a simple thing to carry, that life as a Christian is going to be a walk in the park. The sense is that this yoke fits. It's purpose-designed. It's ergonomic. Just like you don't use a watering pill yoke for an oxen for the oxen to pull the plow, so also Jesus' yoke is purpose designed for sinners. Unlike the Pharisees who laid burdens on the people that they simply couldn't bear, Christ gives us his own yoke. And he asks us to take that up. It's also a burden that's light, easy and light. But again, it doesn't mean that it's a simple thing to carry. That life as a Christian is going to be an easy thing. But it talks about the manner in which it's carried. It's light because of the way we bear this yoke. Now, there's a modern day parable that circulated, especially the late 1800s, but it's popularized in a, a song in 1969. Maybe you're familiar with it. It explains this concept very well. It was a gentleman who's out for a stroll. Imagine the beautiful day, the sun's shining, the birds are chirping. And as he's going along, he comes across this young boy. And the young boy is carrying another crippled young boy on his back as he walks along. So the gentleman is struck by this sight. And he says to the young boy, he said, my, that's quite a heavy load you've got there. But the boy replies, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. You see, the boy could bear that load because he loved his brother. And so also our burdens, the burden that Jesus places on us, his yoke is light because it's a burden of love. It's first of all a burden of his love poured out for us on the cross. But it's a burden of love that changes our hearts, that fills our hearts with love in return. And so we don't stay there at the cross unchanged this tender shepherd changes everything. That yoke that we take up changes everything because it's a yoke of love. He calls us to learn from his gentleness, from his humility. 
He invites us to become his disciples, to sit at the feet of a rabbi who doesn't judge, to sit, sit at the feet of a rabbi who doesn't impose burdens that can't be kept, laws that can't be followed. Of all leaders, he had the right to make demands of the people who came to him. Of all leaders, he could point to himself and say, this is how it's done. But he doesn't, because it's a call that's shown in love. And when he does this, he provides a corrective to the model of, of the Pharisees. The model of the Pharisees who burdened the people refused to lift a finger to help them. He provides a, a corrective also to the model of those in the church today who spend more time judging the faults of others than reflecting the love of God that we've received. Do we recognize that we all come to our Savior with the same burdens of sin and guilt? Do we recognize also that we receive the same light and easy yoke when we come to Christ? And so let our relationships with each other, too, be characterized by the same tenderness and compassion that we find at Jesus' feet. When we do that, we find rest for our souls. This is actually the most shocking part of Jesus' invitation. When we take up Jesus' yoke, we find rest for our souls. Now, if you've used a yoke, you know it's tiring. It's hard work. How can it be that this yoke that Jesus gives us provides rest? Well, the secret is given in the passage we didn't read together, the following chapter, where Jesus taught the disciples what it meant, what the Sabbath was all about. The Pharisees had turned the Sabbath into a burden by having all sorts of rules and regulations about it again. You could only walk so far. You'd only carry so much weight on the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath was all about, again, burdens and rules. The Pharisees failed to recognize that the Sabbath was created for man. That it was a day of joy and delight in God's work of creation, his work of redemption. The Pharisees had forgotten all this. And so they gave rest for the body, but they failed to give rest for the soul. And when they did this, they rejected the fact that this Sabbath was actually pointing forward to Jesus Christ. That they weren't supposed to be thinking so much of that freedom from slavery in Egypt, but of the future slavery, freedom from slavery they were to receive, the deliverance from sin that Jesus Christ could offer. It's only in Jesus Christ that sinners can find rest, can find that shalom that was announced by the angels around Bethlehem. Peace between God and man. This is a rest that comes to us already now, today, because it was ushered in when Christ satisfied God's wrath on the cross. At the cross, rest is found for weary souls. It's a rest that accompanies us throughout life in Jesus Christ. But then receiving that rest will mean submitting ourselves to Christ's yoke. Will mean bearing his yoke. That means accepting the yoke that he provides. Sometimes we have misguided expectations as to what that might look like. John the Baptist, too, was confused at a certain point. He asked that question, are you the one who is to come? He didn't quite understand. The disciples, too, when Jesus was going the way of the cross, they didn't understand what was happening. And so for us, too, today, when we accept Christ's yoke, we might not always understand why the yoke looks the way it does, why the burden feels the way it does. But we find rest when we submit. We find rest when we trust that that yoke is what's best for us. We find rest also in knowing that the battle has been won already. That the burden of the law has been lifted by Christ because he obeyed the law in its entirety. Because he bore the weight of God's wrath against sin in its entirety. And so we look forward too to the full rest that we'll receive when Christ returns. That full rest, full glory, perfect communion between God and man. Do you hear your Savior's invitation?
Lay down your burdens at his feet. Take up his yoke and you'll find rest for your souls. Amen.